Good afternoon, and welcome to Understanding Racialized and Intergenerational Trauma, a conversation with Resma Minikim. Today's program is sponsored by the UCSF Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, the Office of Alumni Relations, the National Center for Excellence in Women's Health, the Black Women's Health and Livelihood Initiative, and the Office of Diversity and Outreach. To get us started, please welcome Dr. Renee Navarro, UCSF Vice Chancellor of Diversity and Outreach. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's program. I'm Dr. Renee Navarro and I serve as the Vice Chancellor for Diversity and Outreach at UCSF. I'm also a professor of anesthesiology and perioperative care. To begin, we would like to acknowledge the Ramatusha Loni people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to the Ramatusha Loni elders, past, present and future who call this place, the land that UCSF sits upon their home. We are proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Ramatusha Loni community for their stewardship and support. And we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. Today, we will learn about racial and intergenerational trauma. Racial trauma, as I understand it, refers to the increased rates of trauma that Black, Indigenous, and other people of color experience as a result of being exposed to microaggressions, other forms of harassment, discrimination, and violence. And although similar to post-traumatic stress disorder, Racial trauma is unique in that it involves ongoing individual and collective injuries due to exposure and re-exposure to race-based stressors. The murder of George Floyd placed a spotlight on the topic of racialized trauma and its impact on communities of color. In response, there have been calls for social justice, racial equity, and many have asked how to become allies for change. In a few moments, we will hear from New York Times bestselling author, Resma Menikin about the effects of racialized and inter intergenerational trauma, about the importance of mental health and action steps we can engage in to facilitate the necessary changes as well as community building. Ultimately, the intent is for today's conversation to help illuminate a path for healing. Without further ado, I am pleased to introduce John McCoy, Director of the UCSF Alumni Relations, our host for today's program. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Navarro. It's my pleasure to introduce our featured guest, Resma Minikim, the New York Times bestselling author and trauma specialist. Resma has served as the Director of Counseling Services for the Tubman Family Alliance, as the Behavioral Health Director of African American Family Services in Minneapolis, as a Domestic Violence Counselor for the Wilder Foundation, as a certified military and family life consultant to the U.S. Armed Forces, and as a cultural somatics consultant for the Minneapolis Police Department. He currently teaches workshops on cultural somatics for audiences of African Americans, European Americans, and others. He is also a therapist in private, pa private practice. Welcome, Resma. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. No problem. Thank you. And joining Resma in conversation, please welcome Dr. Lisa Fortuna. Dr. Fortuna is Professor and Vice, Cha Vice Chair of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and Chief of Psychiatry at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. Her clinical and, and research areas focus on post-traumatic stress, anxiety and minoritized stress, Latinx and adolescent mental health services, access and quality of care for tradi traditionally underserved, including children, immigrants and ref the refugee population. She practices mindfulness and has studied post-traumatic growth and recovery after disasters and with communities of colors. She also co-authored with Zeta Vallejo, the book Mindfulness-Based CBT for Adolescent PTSD and Addictions. Welcome, Dr. Lisa Fortuna. And lastly, but not least, to moderate our conversation today, please welcome Dr. Eve Ekman, Dr. Ekman is a contemplative social scientist, de scientist designing, delivering, and evaluating tools to support emotional wellness in the field of healthcare, well-being, and technology. 
She draws from interdisciplinary skills and first person exper experiential knowledge from clinical social work, integrative medicine, and contemplative, contemplative science and meditation. She is a lead teacher for cultivating emotional balance, is a well being lead on the health team at Apple, and a senior fellow at the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley. Welcome, Dr. Ekman. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Really looking forward to a rich dialogue here today. And I'm so honored to be moderating this experience by asking some questions and feeling mm -hmm. the responses from both Lisa mm -hmm. and Resma. And mm -hmm. I want to say that, you know, there are going to be times in this dialogue where things will come up that are hard and challenging to hear. Mm -hmm. And we're so fortunate to be here with Resma, who has really shared a vision of when we are working with the challenging material of unresolved historical and ongoing trauma, that we can feel that and hold that in the body. So I just wanna instruct all of our amazing audience who are joining us now and in the future to let the practice of listening be part of the transformation we are all here for. So I really wanna start off here and give a moment, uh, Resma, to, to talk about this book, My Grandmother's Hands, which maybe mm. maybe surprised you in, in how much uh, appeal it had <laughs> internationally mm. and how many people seem to really resonate with a lot of the core themes. There's mm. such an important part in this book in terms of creating language and framework uh, for understanding. Mm. And I was hoping you could unpack a bit for us about what does it mean to have white body supremacy and how does it get systematically and often unconsciously and unwittingly embedded in our American bodies, as you so beautifully describe. Yeah. So one of the first things that I, I, I want to do is uh, I always start with uh, a definition and a rubric because I think that that's important. I'm, I'm, uh, the thing that I'm trying to do is usher in something that currently doesn't exist and I don't quite know what it is, right? And so I think it's important to, under, to, to start off with a definition. And the definition of white body supremacy is that the white body deems and has deemed itself the supreme standard by which all bodies humanity shall be measured philosophically and structurally. Now, just want that to land just for a second. So I'm not just talking about white supremacy as a um, as you know uh, something that we should know about as a cognition as a uh, as 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 an idea. I'm talking about how the that that what we're working with structurally is a system that is predicated on the white body deeming and deemed itself the standard of humanness. So when we talk about whiteness or white people or white bodies, we're not just talking about that in kind of like a, um, uh, a, uh, uh, a um, you know, like, 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 like a euphemism. I'm talking about that there was a, that, that the idea of the white body being human and everything and every other body Every other body in that in this kind of pigmentocracy, every other body is a deviant, not just from the not just from whiteness, but from the standard of humanness. And so, and so all of my work is around the violence of that, <laughs> right? The the trump, the, the anguish of that, the weathering and the withering of being in the structure of that, the 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 undercoupling for white bodies of understanding really the depth of the feralness when it comes to that. And so for me, I want to start with that framing first, because I don't want people to start as they're hearing me and sis uh, begin to start talking, that they start to begin to think about this in the same ways, um, like uh, a cogn in, a, in a way of just cognition. Oh, I got some good, some good little uh, tidbits from from Resma and um, and 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 that that idea uh, uh, is enough to combat the feralness of white body supremacy. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I'd love to follow up on that with um, yeah, Lisa, your experience in terms of reading my grandmother's hands and. Um, how it speaks to your own research, you know, especially in historically underserved communities and any personal reflections that may be captured in, in Resma's really intimate portrait of his own grandmother, right? So anything you'd like to share about your research as well as being a granddaughter, being a parent and what this book uh, 
inspired in you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, first off, the, the title attracted <laughs> me to it immediately. Um, you know, growing up with a very involved grandmother who, who I think was very influential in how I even think about my, my clinical work. And I, mm. I talked to people about my grandmother having a third grade education, but mm -hmm. being my model for a physician. Um, and mm -hmm. that was pretty much because she, um, she used herbology, she used massage, mm -hmm. she used faith and, and healing practices and was really the healer in our community for mm -hmm. Lat Lat Latino and, and black um, mm -hmm. neighbors, right? Who would mm -hmm. come over and really um, feel mm -hmm. trusting of her. And so, so I think that opened up my sensibilities about mm -hmm. my own self-care in, yeah. in, in being a, a woman of color, yeah. um, working with you know traumatized, you know trauma experiencing communities, and also uh, walking in a predominantly uh, white world, right? As a, as a yeah. physician and an academic, yeah. um, how to sort of you know be in tune with my body and to use those things that are self care, and I think where that's opened me up in my research and clinical work as well, which I think is really important for all of us to consider, is um, how are we in connection, you know, with our own trauma. Um, mm. in our bodies and how we experience that, which I think is um, what's brilliant about this, about this book and, and what Resmo uh, presents to us. Um, because I think it's really the work that we have to do and be fully embodied in um, to be able to work with others. And, 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 and I get this tested out all the time when I'm working with uh, young people, um, adolescents mm. in research and in my clinical work. Um, you know, I've come with a training, a CBT model, right? I've done research in cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and it became really quick that the youth were telling me, well, <laughs> it, it cannot just be all in my head. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I'm experiencing exper uh, discrimination, you know, I get tense, I can't hold it. Um, you know, so we really worked around how they support and work with their bodies and be in tune mm -hmm. so that they can have steps to keep mm -hmm. themselves well and safe and attune yeah. their ability to manage those things yeah. and opening up the avenues to be able to bring in those issues of body and spirituality, even into, mm -hmm. into the research and how we design this work and how do we sort of support therapists in doing that work. So that, that's all been part of, of the research because I think the mm -hmm. community and our patients will, will tell us that. If yeah. 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 Can, can, Eve, can I can I say something to what Sister Lisa just please, said? Please, So, so, um, I, I I love how she started off talking about how you know her her training and her expertise and is in a certain way you know CBT and and um, in um, in working with adolescents and working with with uh, bodies of culture that have that have and continue to experience the feralness of this structure. The beautiful thing that I, that I, that I, I love about what she said is she said, and a shaping quality of that was my grandmother, right? My grandmother helped shape how I moved, how, 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 what, what I vibed into, what the rhythm was, what the, what the, the, what the image is, what the texture is, what the meaning making, the shifts in meaning, what the what the affect is, and the emotional like 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 what my what my grandmother did, and my grandmother did the same thing was help to shape my understanding of how I move through time and space, and so for me, that 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 what what really helps our communities um, that come to us for help, what really helps them is do they get a sense of that we are being with them, that we are, that we are present. And I don't mean present like, like everybody's talking about presence and, and, and uh, trauma and all of these catch, everybody's talking about that. But the rhythm and the, and, and the experience of presence is, can't be fake. It has to be authentic. And, and many times, bodies of culture are moving in and around structures that are inauthentic. And what I, what I love about what, what, what Sister Lisa just said, is she said that one of the pieces is my training, but the other piece is how I be with these 
with, 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 with these adolescents and how I be with these adolescents allows for me to both have a, uh, so one of the things I say about somatic abolitionism is that as you begin to work with the energies of, of somatic abolitionism, you will, you will, one, three, there are three requirements. The first one is that you develop a thickened skin because if you're going to do any work that goes against what the structure says you should be doing, you better have a thickened skin. You better have a fortified mindset. And, and in, in that, you, you better develop a malleable heart at the same time. And so often what happens when we're working with these structures is that we develop a thick skin, a fortified mindset, and a hardened heart. And what I love about what Lisa said is that her grandmother and others nurtured her enough to where she could keep some of that malleability. So when the people that were in front of her were saying, no, nah, there's something else here, she could hear it from the heart and not just from what was trained and put into her. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you for, for lifting that up for us. And you brought up two other really important terms. I just want to make sure our, our listeners are catching on to the bodies of culture and also yeah. um, somatic abolitionism. And if you, mm -hmm. if you wouldn't mind just a beat on, on those two so that we make sure right. folks are really tracking with us. So I, I, as a part of the languaging that's emerging from the work that I'm doing, I don't use uh, people of color anymore because people of color, that that term is really a term that 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 um, that really is about uh, a color, but not color in a way that is that that has any uh, cosmological depth to it or mm -hmm. any type of philosophical depth to it. Right. That it was only in juxtaposition to white, that color that this idea was coming out. And so that, that's why I always say that that tacit faint voice up underneath when we're talking about some of these terms is mm -hmm. always a centering of whiteness as the standard and everything else is a deviant from the standard. So I say bodies of culture because bodies of culture for me is about reclaiming that mm -hmm. which was tried to be stripped from us, right? The, the, the first, af, the, one of the first uh, collective uh, uh, announcements that you are a person is that you have you are steeped in culture right and so those are the pieces the language the the ways i move through time and space those pieces are the first things to be stripped from you and replaced with urgency placed hmm. with productivity and so that's why i don't use the term uh people of color i say bodies of culture because i really want people to situate this in the body somatic abolitionism is my expression it's not something i created it was it's 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 what's been it's 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 kind of weaving together for me in terms of my understanding for uh uh uh, uh, uh how um uh, uh white body supremacy has ravaged bodies of culture right how it has made um uh how it has stripped uh, uh collectively white bodies understanding of humanness Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so there's a re for me, there's a reclaiming that bodies of culture have to begin to do, uh, 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 in this structure. And there is a rehumanization that white bodies have to do in this structure. So that one, so somatic abolition is, is my container for how to hold these reactions, um, and, and, and see what emerges as we hold these, 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 uh, these energies, this four and 500 year energy around this thing that we call race. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. It's, the language is so important and then the instruction over and over to bring it back to the body. And mm -hmm. so that's just what I, I'm continuing to learn from you. Um, for, mm -hmm. our, for our next question, you know, I, I'd really like us to take on something um, that is a big challenge, uh, not only now and historically, both in health and mental health research, really we rely upon a feeling of trust between institutions and the providers who work there with the communities being served. And we may possibly in this, in this country and maybe globally be at an all time low of trust from the general public and especially bodies of culture towards healthcare providers and scientists. And this mistrust uh, is not new and it's not unfounded. So how do we understand those, the historical implications um, and what can we do to work with this? And Lisa, I'd, I'd love to start with you on this question of 
How have you had experience with this working with it, of course, in your research and as a clinician? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, as you, as you said, it's really important to understand that mistrust of, uh, of the system, right, of services that, that we offer, um, it, you know, it, it, has, uh, it has truth behind it, right, in terms of why people uh, have been, you know, don't trust because they have been harmed. Um, and, and I would say it's not just historical. I mean, it's historical. The historical pieces are critical because they continue to live uh, within communities um, and, and there's an awareness out of survival to avoid things that are harmful, right? So, so that trust has, uh, has reason, right? And, and, it, and, it's, and it's reasonable, right? Um, and the other piece is, is that um, we really have to focus on how we provide or offer or invite people into opportunities for healing and, and if we're gonna call them services that, that really has this historical trauma, racialized trauma in mind as, as our framework and not just something that's put on, on a history book, right? But that it actually has mm. a really palpable piece of how we engage with communities. Mm. Um, you know, communities will, you know, I always find even in our research that uh, folks will read a situation very quickly um, when they come into a system of care um, and immediately uh, check out what, what, where's the danger? You know, where's the threat? Where's the harm? And sometimes the threat uh, could be very um, pronounced, you know, in terms of I'm not going to get the right care. I'm, I'm going to lose my, my child to foster care. You know, all of these things that are really, um, you know, fit, felt in the body. And I think people track it even before we, we talk, right? They, they see what, what is going on in, in the particular social situation. I, I think where it's worked for me in, in trying to overcome that is keeping that in my mind that even, you know, as a Latina, you know, it does not mean that I don't represent that system as well. And so I have to come at it with um, sort of that invitation. I think that Resmo was talking about that being and, mm -hmm. and openness to how people define um, their, their healing, their trauma, um, I always talk about it and I talk about it in my book. It's not about fixing people or having the prescription, but serving uh, mm. the people that mm. we encounter and, and, mm. and serving with the understanding that they do have what they need uh, to heal. And I'm just serving that process mm. with them. So, so I do go out into the community and ask them, you know, what are the healing practices that you do? And and, and they're often a lot of the things that Resma talks about in terms of movement, spirituality, um, culture, um, the Latino community around San Francisco general that talks about la cultura cura, the culture mm. heals, right? So mm. to, you know, moving into those depths of what people know are healing. Um, and it often is in the body and in spirituality and in culture and connection. Um, uh, and then you can bridge other things when people need what we call psychiatry or anything else, right? You can bridge that, but you have to start uh, with an awareness of where people start. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, Resma, I'd love to hear your reflections and thoughts on this, this topic as well. Yeah, you know, um, uh, Sister Lisa said something a few moments ago or, or earlier about when she's working with clients that, um, that uh, sometimes the clients will say back to her, you know, all of this stuff ain't just in my head. Um, and I think one of the most healing things that we can do, especially with bodies of culture, is to say, you're not crazy. That, that, <laughs> that, what, that, that what you're vibing is real. Um, I think we have the structural gaslighting kind of reflex that we do to bodies of culture, you know, when, 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 when we're reacting to things that to other people seem very minor, but to us seems like we could possibly be um, annihilated, right? That we have a tendency to put that, put that inside of the people as being some defect in them or in their culture. You know, one of the things that I say is that trauma um, in a person over time decontextualized can look like uh, uh, personality. 
trauma decontextualized in a family trait over time can look like, uh, 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 in a family can look like family trait. And trauma in a people over time can look like culture. And so uh, for me, when I'm working with people, I'm always looking at, you know, how the historical, the intergenerational, the persistent, I, don't, I say that bodies of culture and black bodies specifically do not deal with post-traumatic stress disorder. We deal with per, per, pervasive and persistent traumatic stress disorder. Um, a, a, a constant denial that anything has even happened um, and th that we should be concerned about. Um, and so for me, this idea of cultivation and um, culti helping to cultivate those pieces of joy that are a resource that are in us, not just, not just, um, not just responding to the, 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 the threat and the trauma, but also responding to when the joy pops up, when so people can begin to kind of footnote that, oh, yes, all of this stuff is happening. And there are opportunities, there are times when I am relatively safe in my home or relatively safe in my car, relatively safe. There are times where I can actually cultivate the sense of joy. Um, so this system doesn't weather me and wither me in, qu in quite the same ways. And so when I'm listening to, 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 uh, to Sister Lisa, one of the things that I think about is, you know, right now, yesterday, we just started the, the um, trial for uh, a Potter, a uh, police officer up here in Minneapolis who uh, shot and murdered a young black, uh, uh, a young black male, Dante Wright. And I think about the communal anguish of now not just going through the Kyle Rittenauer, not just going through, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, what happened in the Charlottesville, not just going through um, the Amar Arbery, not just going through uh, um, uh, um, Breonna Taylor, but, but the consistent destruction of black bodies, right? How do we begin to develop a way in our communities that can deal with not just the episodicness that we think it is, but the persistent and consistent destruction of Black and Indigenous bodies um, um, as a way of, 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 of accentuating healing in these communities and not just look for people, uh, not just do quote unquote things with people or to people when they come into our office. How do we create, how do we um, develop ways of of, be, um, um, whole, of being accountable to other bodies, so that when other bodies come into our offices, we already have cultivated um, a, uh, a, a, a a way of being in, that I don't have to necessarily get CEUs for. So, thank you. Yeah. And I think what I'm hearing from both of you is, um, and especially from Lisa, that mistrust is healthy. Uh, uh -huh. Mistrust is, is, is valid, it's important. It's not something that um, clinicians or scientists are trying to get rid of or avoid or not a sign or signal of a, a problematic or difficult patient encounter. And I think that reframing is um, something probably we need to remember on a minute to minute basis. Yeah. So I'd love to to shift a bit and and talk actually a bit about healing and especially Resma, you've you've used the ancestral forms of healing bodies of culture um, that help people reconnect to the body and mm -hmm. these are drawn from indigenous faith traditions and yeah I was I was hoping to hear you describe a bit the role of faith traditions in the practice yeah. of healing racial trauma. Yeah, uh, this next thing I'm going to say probably is going to piss some people off, but it, it, it is what it is. I, I think when we're trying to develop something that that speaks to the four and 500 years of, of feralness and brutality as it relates to um, uh, Black and Indigenous bodies, um, I think sometimes we forget that um, that we're going to have to create these pieces and not try and retrofit 
things into this. We have to we have to nurture this thing so what needs to emerge can emerge. A lot of times what I see is that people try and retrofit the things that I'm talking about into a yoga practice or they try and retrofit the things that I'm talking about into a religious practice or try and retrofit it into something. And at the moment you do it, you truncate the possibilities, right? And um, because this whole, this a lot of this stuff is structured around, you know, uh, e you know even things like DEI work are structured around um, white comfort, right? Talking, being able to say things so white people don't lose their minds, right? And so I think when I'm thinking about joy i'm thinking about it as more of a spiral right that 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 when i heal from when i when i heal or involved in the healing process uh i can I, there are there, it is it is it is a historical intergenerational institutional and a personal experience and so when i began to heal with those notions that my ancestors are are bestowing on me like 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 my ancestors when they're talking to me, they don't speak in English. They don't speak in Spanish. They don't speak in Portuguese. They don't speak in French. They don't, you know what I mean? They speak in vibes and vibrations. And I have to condition myself to be able to hear what it is to say. And that is a lifelong process of he, being able to hear when there is, when I can discern a shift in meaning, right? Um, and this is not cognitive, this shows up in the body as vibes and vibrations. Our bodies are both, are both receivers and amplifiers. And so for me, this idea of healing, has, there is a conditioning that has to be done in order, uh, in order for us to even be able to hear the depth of what's being said. If we just think about it and try and retrofit it into another practice, we can, it, it 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 limits what we can it limits what we can hear what we're actually able to so 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 for me cult joy cultivation is really about being with other bodies and and i have a tendency to have bodies of culture with bodies of culture and white bodies with white bodies because white bodies have this undercoupling that they that 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 has to be worked with that when you start slamming these bodies into a room together you're not number one you're not equating for the charge and number two you're not equating for the escape hatches that are built mm -hmm. into a white body supremacist structure so for me joy is one of those things that that has to uh i, I believe we I, I believe that that trauma is not primary trauma trauma is actually a protective thwarting energy just like what, what Einstein said, that, that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Trauma is an energy that, thwarted, that thwarts and constricts, right? The reason why we must deal with trauma is that it thwart and constricts what's generative and emergent, right? Mm -hmm. And so we must work with the energy of it so what is already there that wants to emerge can begin to emerge but if we don't work with the trauma and 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 the decontextualization of it 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 can't quite emerge in the ways that we need it to emerge so joy is always there trauma is not primary joy love is primary but it is thwarted it is constricted mm -hmm. I'm not even sure if that answered the question, but oh, it was what came to me. That, yeah, thank you. And um, I, I want to, again, just like highlight and lift up um, something that you said might piss people off, but I think is really worth mentioning, which is we may not be able to make these practices um, evidence-based or manualized or, yeah. um, you know, this kind of pearl of wisdom we love so much in teaching and education mm -hmm. and in a medical setting. And mm -hmm. that's a big freedom, actually. That's yeah. an invitation yeah. and an openness of yeah. um, how folks are going to learn to bring what's natural for them into the healing right. process. And so right. I really appreciate that um, openness. So, so I, I'd really like to hear from Lisa, but, 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 you know, when I talk about these structures, Many of my people, people that look like me in terms of pigmentation, people that look like me have been brutalized by some of these practices, right? Over centuries brutalized. You know, the conquistadors were, were, were I mean, they brutalized a people, right? Missionaries 
uh, with all their niceness and kindness, brutalized a people and, and, and created a ground for land to be taken. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so, you know, these, these things, these notions around, well, let's just bring spirituality into it, or let's just bring that to me, it has to be an emergent spirituality, not a coerced spirituality. Right. Um, so that's. Thank you. Yeah, Lisa, I would love to hear, um, you know, uh, either any response you'd like to what Resma uh, is sharing with us and that richness. And yeah, if it feels um, also like maybe the that piece around what do these faith traditions or spiritual experiences, how can they support the healing process, uh, given your own personal experience and work? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I, you know, I, I want to underline um, what I think a lot of people might be experiencing and hearing this is that it's it's not this cognitive thing, right? It, it's not an intellectualized thing. And, and I know a lot of people are asking questions like, you know, how do I, you know, tell me the, the thing, right, that I need to do to make this right. And, um, and I'm appreciative of the desire because that's the first step. Um, but I think it's, it's, you know, even as Resma's speaking, you know, um, I, I, I'm of a, of a practice of even sort of just like I, how, even through the Zoom, how I'm feeling and resonating with what he's saying. And I actually experience it in vibration. And it's a very, uh, you know, it's a very interesting thing for me as he's talking of like, like I'm, it's vibing with me, right? And I think that that whole idea of being, right? So, 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 so. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a Episcopal priest, okay? So, but I never talk about um, doctrine or, or ask very specific questions around Christianity or, or even in the mindfulness, right? Even if we do practice, I try to sort of see how that yes. connects with the person's practice or not, right? And, and how do we work with that? Um, I worked with Muslim communities, right? And never spoke a word about Islam, yes, Islam, yes, Christianity, mm -hmm. and they they've asked me. Oh, I think you're a woman of the good book because it's just, I just feel it. And and, and what is it? It's just basically that openness yeah. to um, to being with people and and that emergence of what is the spirituality, right? So so I've had young people who after a while um, have said, you know, I want to. I want to talk to you about this vision that I have of someone that's passed that's coming to me to talk with me um, and making something better around around my trauma, right? And this was a young woman who was very stuck with her depression. And, um, and once we started to explore what was emerging in these conversations that she, and first she said, you think, you know, I think I'm crazy. And I'm that's like, right. no, no, I, I do it's not. Nice. And so then she started telling me about this vision and the conversation and the healing hmm. that we had to do with this person who had passed, come before her, was very critical. And I saw that then her depression started to elevate in my measures of depression, right? But I think it was that in, that that openness and the space yeah. that we can sort of bring to people that 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 yeah. it, again it comes from this not fixing, yeah, but serving. Yeah the emergence yeah. of those things. And then yeah. I talk to people about where do they find that in like their faith community? Because there's a lot that right. can faith communities is transcendent, there's ritual, there's physicality, there's community. That's where sort of, you know, bodies connect, right? And sort of deal right. with healing. Scripture is a, right. a whole long trauma story about right. how people overcame and persisted despite enslavement and everything else, right? In, yeah, in yeah. The Hebrew Bible. So, we work with all of those things, but we let it emerge from where yes, it's resonating yes, with people, where they've been conditioned, yes, and how do I serve that? Yeah, I would also like to say that 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 um, that when I'm listening to to Sister Lisa, one of the things that's coming up is um, people may hear that and they they may hear, oh, I can do that. I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, 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 what she's saying, I can do, right? And what I, what I want you to do is just, um, just hold that for a moment. Just, just, just like, like, like there is such a sense of urgency. I believe that one of the primary um, um, uh, uh, linchpins of white body supremacy is urgency.
like even when you just heard me pause, just notice how you wanted me to get to the next piece, right? Rather than just holding that, that is a conditioning, that is a tempering, that is a rep, as I, as I always say. Being able to sit with the things that are disparate, right? And allow things to emerge and begin to be able to, to see the things that emerge as not as good or bad or evil or stuff like that, but as things to be curious about. Things I always talk about um, uh, this idea of whenever people come and see me when I'm doing workshops and stuff like that, they always ask me, well, Resma, give me the top four tools that I could use to work with people. And one of the things that I'll caution people about, and this is from uh, Sister um, Nieto, uh, Leticia Nieto, she talks about, we need to stop thinking about this as toolboxes and start thinking about this more as toy boxes. And just notice when you heard me say toy box, just notice like did, 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 was there, like there's a, there is a certain piece a resonance that when you say toolbox, it suggests that there is a right tool to fix this problem as opposed, as opposed to toolbox, toy box when, you're, when you say, how do I explore into these things? How do I be playful? How do I see if this Barbie doll fits into this square hole? And how do I, right, like, like how do I begin to cultivate the idea of, of, of toys as opposed to tools. And so when I'm listening to Sister Lisa, Lisa, I'm hearing this piece around, she had to go through some things before she was able to be with people this way. This is not uh, something that you just, you don't learn how to do this in your practicum. You don't learn how to do this, you know, when you're doing your rounds. This is something that you have to pay attention to and watch the emergence in yourself. So, so when it happens in other people and you start to start to recognize it, you actually see it as data points. You actually see it as something that's useful as opposed to something that is not useful and, and, and peripheral. So. I was practicing making a pause there, Resma. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah, so rich. Um, I'd love to get one of the one of the wonderful questions our audience submitted ahead of time. Um, and before I do so, just to say that you know, in in your book, you really highlight that um, we're going to want to create change immediately. Um, we, we really want people to be able to, we want to use these practices and you encourage yeah. folks to just um, read the whole book and do every practice. Yep. And happily, yep. the workbook now is out so folks can yep. really work through it together. Yep. And so again, kind of highlighting this idea of it's not don't do anything. Right. Working with the urgency and, and working deliberately to see what comes up instead of forcing it. So yeah, thank That's you it. for that again. That's it. So one of the questions that came up was uh, really around just our very first question, kind of connecting to grandmother and ancestor. And the question is, when we don't know what grandmother's hands were like, how can we connect with our ancestors? I don't know if either one of you would like to, to venture into that. Cecily, do you want to go first or? You go ahead. So this is one of the things that, 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 that I think that people, when we talk about ancestors, is that they assume that there is some human face that we need to attribute to, you know. So this was my great grandmother, or, or Dr. Martin Luther King keeps showing up. Like, I mean, that's, that's, that's what people think that we're looking for a specific piece. And one of the things that I... That I believe, that I think, or I believe, is that you know this is energy, right? And that and that we are energy having a human experience, and that um, that when I'm talking about ancestors, I am talking about um, creation itself. We are not apart from creation; we are part of creation. 
some of our doctrines would have us to believe that we are we should be dominion over everything and as opposed to commu in communion with everything and part of part of our work i believe is really um uh about um, um, um beginning to uh what's the word um Just give me one second, y'all. Beginning to have a broader, there it is, a broader understanding of ancestralhood, right? Ancestralhood for me is both creation, elemental, um, um, rock, fire, uh, 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 water. Um, the, I mean, it it is it is it, it is ancestral. It is uh, it is in communion with creation, not a part of creation, not some entity that bestows certain things on me and not other things on other people. And so for me, um, this idea of, of, um, of, 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 of ancestorhood is really about moving things away that allow me, that, 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 that force me a way that, that forced me not to see myself in connection with creation itself. And so and my ancestors are, are elemental, are, ans are, are, are ancestral in terms of, you know, some type of human, but, but, they, but in this essence, they are energetic. Um, and so I can, I can, I, so, so, it is so my understanding is not just a person, although sometimes people show up, um, which is why the first practice in the book is about who showed up, <laughs> right? That who showing up is not who as in personality, but who showed up as in vibes and vibrations, who showed up as in image, thought, experience, imaginations, right? Who showed up in terms of a shift in meaning? Who shows up in terms of weight and texture? That's what I mean when I say ancestor. Thank you. Lisa, anything you'd like to share? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say it's once again, <laughs> kind of getting out of our head, right? Um, <laughs> you know, we like to think about what we could see and touch in certain ways, right? Um, yeah. I think what this is really calling is to say that, that, that sort of awareness Right, and this is part of sort of being and not rushing it. A, you know, awareness to what you experience in your body. There is this one interesting exercise that I have to add that when I was in seminary, um, that kind of uh, tapped me into this in an interesting way, and it was in my uh, preaching course. And you know, and I'm sort of, of course, I'm thinking, and I'm like, let me put the words right, and let me preach or whatever. And I had this voice uh, instructor who uh, who taught preaching and voice. And she talked about tapping into your voice, which is mm. more than just the physical parts, right? Mm -hmm. You know, she's saying even the way your your mouth is formed and constructed and how your energy is comes from so many people before you. Yes, in yes. DNA, how your body is formed, how your mouth is formed, so that when you speak, you Come are on. actually speaking with the voice of the ancestors that came before you Come to on. create you in that voice. Come on. And that was a very deep experience for me in tapping into then what, what does come from that voice, which is more mm -hmm. than here, but it is this other energetic ex experience that is embodied in me. Yeah. So it really yeah. embodied that ancestral voice for me. And so it's a whole yeah. other way of framing how do we think yeah. about even what we speak and what emerges, is that emergence. Mm -hmm. and, and being aware and being so that 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 you are an instrument of that emergence i, I guess that's that it makes sense. so 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 lisa just says so an instrument of that emergence right that that the so one of my one of my uh elders used to always say in in, in, in some ways it was an it was an admonishment of me um he used to say at some point you're going to learn to listen to the voice within the voice at some point or not <laughs> right? right and so and so what that spoke to me was is that there is this there is this 
sense of conditioning and tempering that many of us are not willing to do. Many of us are not willing to, to do that tempering both individually and communally, do that tempering and conditioning. So, 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 so what's being experienced and communicated, we, we can actually hear it, right? Um, without the bypassing, without the spiritual bypassing, without the sexual bypassing, without the, the, the yoga bypassing. I mean, we can yoga the hell out of it, anything right <laughs> we some we i mean and, and and so and so but that doesn't stop the voice within the voice right that's a conditioning process that's not a workshop you don't that's not that is that is information and things that are, are given to you and bestowed upon you and then over time they create a glue in the tapestry many of us want to want to leapfrog over that <laughs> We want things on the front end that only can happen on the back end. So, yeah. Wow, that was incredibly rich. I am. I look forward to, yeah, experiencing my voice in that way, Lisa. Thank you for offering that. It's um, really unique opportunity. So I think we have time for just one more of these questions. I will say many of the questions are, what can I do? How can I do it? So we covered yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> Sit tight. Yeah. Sit pause. tight. <laughs> pause. Um, pause. And the first thing is to pause. Because mm -hmm. in the pausing, in the pausing, and Sister Lisa knows this, in the pausing, quaking begins to happen, right? And especially, there's no, to me, race, has such a charge to it, four and 500 year old unexplored charge to it, that when you pause it, specifically in white bodies, when mm. they pause the quaking, that quaking begins to reverberate. And most of the time, what we think is healing is to help people stop the quaking. Mm -hmm. Actually, that stops the healing. You have to condition a body to be able to hold and contend with that quaking. So what could emerge over time has the has the, develops the capacity to emerge. If you're if when the quaking happens, you're so quick to stop it and figure out ways to yoga the hell out of it. You're going to um, you, eventually you, that energy. Remember, we talk about energy. That energy is going to keep building up behind the dam, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, 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 and. Um... I, I yeah, again, just want to like lift up and highlight that that point is, of course, there's nothing wrong with yoga. Yoga is wonderful. And yet, if we're applying it to avoid feeling the necessary pain, and I'm, I'm going to go back on myself and actually what I really love to hear, uh, maybe as a way for us to kind of start winding down this wonderful conversation is, yeah. is about clean pain and dirty pain. Right? Yeah. So I just find that to be a conceptualization so yeah. profound yeah. Um, and, and useful. Right. So that act, so that, that came from uh, two mentors of mine uh, who both uh, passed, one passed last year. One was Dr. David Snarsh, who wrote a book called Passionate Marriage and the Sex Crucible. And then um, uh, Dr. James Maddock. Uh, um, two reasons why I'm mentioning First, for the first reason is that they loved me and nurtured me um, through my development as a therapist. And, and the person who's also still living is Dr. Uh, Oliver Williams at the University of Minnesota. But, um, but they came, they were, we used to talk about clean and dirty all the time, not versus, not clean or like, not clean versus dirty, but clean and dirty. And because you, because both are important elements to our development, right? And that dirty, dirty is that experience, like when we talk about racialization of white body supremacy, dirty is that experience that, you know, particularly white bodies have where they know that what is happening and what they're experiencing in the anguish, they know that it is, that, that in order for it to change that they're gonna to have to do something. And dirty is deciding not to do anything. And that resonance that you experience with that. And, and either by omission or commission, you, you become complicit with a white body supremacist system. Clean 
is when you begin to do something and that's that's painful too right clean pain has the ability to build capacity in ways that dirty pain does not dirty pain uh, gets you around what you should be going through right dirty pain is not evil eventually if you do it long enough you begin to come up against yourself and you say i don't know what i'm going to do but i ain't doing that no more right <laughs> i don't know what the next and that and now all of a sudden you find yourself moving into clean not pain as adults we know i mean how many of us have been in relationships with people and we know i probably should not be in a relationship with this person <laughs> I mean, if I look at everything that I, pro but you can't extricate yourself from, it, right? That's dirty. You know, it's dirty and you can't clean is when you get to that place and you go, yeah, this is going to suck really bad. <laughs> you know, uh, and I got to go, I, I can't do this. Right. And as adults, we don't get a choice between clean. And when it comes to racism, white bodies have built in escape hatches, right? And so there is less consequences for doing nothing as opposed to doing something. Just ask the, the people that Kyle Rittenauer shot, the white bodies that Kyle Rittenauer shot, right? There is consequences towards confronting racism and, 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 and moving out on on uh, wanting justice for a black body, right? There's consequences. And that's exactly why wh most white bodies don't engage because they know the consequences could be death and murder and feralness and lack of access. And so they would rather be complicit than to actually develop a culture that can actually hold their transformation. So that's clean and dirty. Thank you. Yeah. And Lisa, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us maybe a little um, a little bit of how you see, especially some of the themes and topics here weaving into your work and then the greater work of UCSF to, to be with and move towards the, the clean pain. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Reza is bringing it that it's it's not um, it's not going to be by workarounds. Right, because there there is a threat, right, to sort of doing doing this work, and if it's not something that seems as dangerous as being shot for standing up for black bodies, it it, it could be a sense of loss um, mm. or or change, right? That yeah. that seems yes. that people may be weary of what what seems to be a stripping of privilege, or that yeah. you know, um, and that's the challenge and. And to do that as a system, um, it's not overnight. Like this is what we've been mm -hmm. saying. It's not we're going to have the twenty points and we're going to work through them. It's it's really around working through the process. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I had this fantasy of people, everyone listening, <laughs> to actually w work through his book um, because mm -hmm. you know I I gained a lot from it. Mm. Um, I listened. Thank, thank you for that, sis. Thank you. Thank oh, you for yeah. that. By the way. And I listened when you said, do not skip over this because you can sort of skip over. And there were yeah. some exercises that were um, painful and challenging, but, yes. but, but necessary. Yeah. Um, and, and I think if we could walk through that, if everyone walked through that, um, it might build the scaffolding of how do we, how do we That's do it. in this way? Um, and, and it's the being. It's yeah. the way, right? That yeah. that'll get us there more than um, the facts, per se. Scaffolding, building a scaffolding, building a container that can actually hold this charge. Many times when we start to begin to do this work, we just go, okay, let's just talk. Let's just talk about implicit bias. Let's come in and do EDI work. And what ends up happening is that you quickly realize that you don't have the scaffolding that can that, that is tempered enough to be able to withstand that charge, right? <laughs> you know, and, and so beautiful. Yeah, the idea of creating a scaffolding, a container that can actually contain and hold the charge of race as opposed to assuming that people should already have that scaffolding. We do not, we do not have the scaffolding. Hmm. So, yeah. Thank you both so much. I really 
uh, feel so enriched by this conversation as I'm sure our viewers now and in the future will. And I wanna mm. invite John to come back and help us wrap up towards the end here. Yeah, thank you um, all for a fabulous conversation. Um, the comments mm. are um, amazing and it's um, been quite helpful to the, to the audience. Um, mm. I wanted to remind everyone that if you did sign up for the after the talk processing session, um, I placed the link for that in the chat box. I'll um, send it out one more time in the chat box. Go ahead and copy and paste that link into your um, web um, internet um, browser. You should be able to access the session. Uh, and then finally, um, thank you to um, our, our, our panelists and our guests, uh, Resma Minikim, thank you so much for making the time. Dr. Mm -hmm. Lisa Fortuna, um, thank you so much for adding to the conversation. And Dr. Eve Ekman, thank you for uh, moderating. Um, it's been a pleasure um, having you all be part of this. Also want to thank Alyssa, <sighs> Dr. Alyssa Eppel for um, helping to coordinate this and um, connect all of the, um, the UCS, UCSF community and beyond. And of course, Dr. Renee Navarro also for um, coming mm -hmm. aboard. Everyone have a nice afternoon. afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.